The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. This is eConversations, a joint production of Troy Trojan Vision and the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. Now, here's your host, Dr. Dan Sutter. Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. For more than three decades, the late Walter Williams educated thousands of Americans on economics through his syndicated columns, his books, and radio appearances for Rush Limbaugh. Walter was dubbed the people's economist, and his clear, concise economic thinking always informed his commentary. Although Walter was unique in many ways, his economic analysis was clearly informed by his graduate training at the University of California at Los Angeles. UCLA was home for some of the greatest economists of the 20th century during those years, and the imprint of the distinctive UCLA School of Thought has a, was apparent both in this faculty scholarship and the research of their students like Walter. What was distinctive about the economics of UCLA, and how those insights and advances made their impact of the profession today? Joining me on the show today is Dr. David Henderson, a fellow at the Hoover Institution, Emeritus Professor of Economics at the Naval Postgraduate School, and who served as an economist during the Reagan administration. More importantly, Dr. Henderson earned his PhD in economics at UCLA during the program Zenith, and recently co-authored with Steve Globerman the, a book called The Essential UCLA School of Economics. Welcome back to the show, David. Thanks, Dan. And let's let's get started here. Right, tell us, uh, tell our viewers a little bit about the time that we have that you know we have in mind here, referring to this UCLA school, and and then we can get into some of the uh, leading figures, some of its leading figures, guys that I've learned a tremendous amount of e economics about uh, from reading from reading their work. Although I never got a chance to really to meet them, so you you can tell us a little bit more about them as people, and then uh, explain their work to us a little bit. Yeah, I like to say that. Walter Williams and I were there during the golden years, which went roughly from the late 60s to, say, the mid-80s. You, you could argue the late 80s. The two people, and their, their pictures are on the cover, who are most important in the UCLA school are Armin Elchin, who spent his whole career at UCLA, and Harold Demsetz, who went back and forth between UCLA and the University of Chicago. It was Demsetz who came to my university in Winnipeg, Canada, and convinced me that I should go into economics. And uh, I probably wouldn't be an economist if I hadn't met him. So I owe him a lot. And what was distinct is the whole idea of property rights and incentives. The way I summarized what Armin said in his class and in his work is, you tell me the rules, and I'll tell you the outcomes. In other words, if, if I know the property rights, if I know the rules, I can predict behavior. And they applied that insight across a number of things. UCLA was relatively non-mathematical. It wasn't that they were afraid of math. They just didn't find it that useful for the kinds of things they wanted to look at. And Demses was similar to Elton in that sense. And so they did a lot of the, the big, important work that's still with us today on the economics of property rights, for example. And that was a, a time in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s where with a lot of different leading economics departments had sort of their own style. There, you know, you could even refer to it as a school. Uh, you referred to UCLA school, but I mean, there was also the Chicago school that was very well known, and like, there was also the Virginia school. And so there's something about the economics profession back in, in those days was and it seemed to lend itself a little bit more to these you know, the departments having, at some level, quite a bit of coherence internally and, and also some distinction about uh, they, they were doing economics at least a little differently than, than other places across the country, right? That's right. And rather, we really have homo homogeneity now. It's kind of boring in a way. Yeah. But yeah, there were distinctive schools. Although Sam Peltzman, who was part of the UCLA school, and we talk about him and his work in the book, mm -hmm. 
Uh, Sam graduated from the University of Chicago with his PhD under George Stigler, who was a really tough taskmaster. Stigler didn't get a lot of PhD students coming out because he was so tough on their dissertations. Anyway, Sam graduated. I went and did my courtesy call on Sam because I'd read his work as an undergrad and I was a big fan already. And I knocked on his door, but what I saw on the door was a bumper sticker that said University of Chicago at Los Angeles. So there was this kind of connection between the two. They were very friendly to each other and they learned a lot from each other. So let's, let's get started here. You, 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 I already mentioned uh, property rights, and that, I think you, as you talk about in the book, I think that's a good way to see sort of the unifying theme of this. But tell us a little bit about, you know, when we talk about property rights, because at one level it's easy enough to like look at stuff and say like, this is my property. From, from an economic standpoint, what, what's important about property? What, what's sort of distinctive about it? Well, um, there are a number of ways to go at that. Let me start with a famous article by Harold Demsetz that was published in the American Economic Review titled Toward a Theory of Property Rights. It's one of the most cited articles from the American Economic Review in history. And what Demsetz did was said, you know, we think of, often we think of property rights as being something that government defines. And that's true, that sometimes happened. He went more basic, more fundamental and said, Often you'll have property rights come about endogenously. In other words, come about due to certain things in reality. And he told the famous story he'd found in some sociological and anthropological work of these Indians, they call them First Nations people in Canada now, the, in, in Canada who were hunting beaver and beaver were very valuable for their pelts. And what happened was one tribe might kind of encroach on the other tribe's area so they essentially developed a system of property rights to minimize the amount of that happening. He contrasts that with the American Southwest, where the, the areas were so vast, there was no need to have property rights. And so that was one of his big insights, that property rights come about kind of naturally when it makes sense to have them. I mean, that was mm -hmm. one of the big things. The other thing, and Elchin pushed, oh, sorry, you were going to ask or say more. There, oh, no, I looked like you were going to ask I, something. I, I, okay. I was going to say, so in, in that actually, uh, you, the, the competition that you're talking about, there's a couple of other important themes here. Competition and scarcity uh, are, are sort of why we, we sort of need to have property rights, right? Right. No, that's right. That's right. And Elchin said he, he, it, wasn't, it was a complementary approach he took. And that was, if you have certain kinds of property rights or lack certain kinds of property rights, certain things will happen. So they did this joint article that I just discovered while my colleague and I were researching this. I grew up in Canada, and there was a show like 60 Minutes uh, in Canada on Sunday night called This Hour Has Seven Days. And I was about 13 or 14 when I'm sitting around with my family and we're watching this horror show because it's all these people clubbing these baby seals to death in the Maritimes. It was horrible. This is awful. This is awful. It was only 50 some years later that I learned about the property rights from their article. And it was that the federal government had set a quota of 50,000 seals. So you're going to go out and get all the ones you can as quickly as you can. And that's why it was such a bloody kind of thing. If they'd had, if they'd said, you have the right to get a thousand seals and give away 50 of those rights, then each one can take their thousand and take their time and not go after the baby seals, go after the adult seals and maybe do it a little more humanely. So there was a, a huge insight right there. And one of the things that property rights end up doing, and, and Alchin has this phrase in, in one of his uh, uh, articles, where he, he talks about uh, property rights turn us from having a competition in, in violence to a competition in, in, you know, I guess in economic competition. Um, and so right. talk, talk a little bit about this, uh, about how it is that property rights, when they're defined and, and accepted, uh, can make society a peaceful and better place. That's right. So let's say you have no property rights and you and I want something, we might end up fighting over it. However, if somehow property rights have developed, either by government or by this more natural process I talked about, if it's yours, it's yours. 
And yeah, I might be a jerk and go after you, but then you can hold me responsible. The cops can come after me and so on. And so, you know, think about it. When you have your house, it's understood that no one can break into your house. And I'm guessing not many people break into your house. So it's relatively peaceful. Whereas if the government said, you know what, you don't own your house. Anyone can have it. You'd be fighting people off every night. So they're right there. Property rights do make us more peaceful. The other thing I want to point out, which kind of the SEAL example leads to, there was a famous biologist named Garrett Hardin who wrote an article called The Tragedy of the Commons. I'm pretty sure it's the most reprinted and cited article ever published in Science Magazine. I had him do a version of it for my Encyclopedia of Economics. Anyway, when I started looking at the timing, I realized this, there was a Dem, this Demsets article came about months before the Hardin article, and Demsets never used the term tragedy of the commons, but that's what he was talking about. I've got it, we've got a quote in the book where he's basically making that point that if no one if no one owns it, you're gonna people are gonna go after it ferociously and you're gonna overexploit the resource. So he actually came up with the tragedy of the commons idea months before Garrett Hardin. UCLA was famous, especially amongst those of us uh, who, who weren't there, but uh, as, as we thought about it, I mean, UCLA was famous for its price there, and, and, and there was a, a distinctive element of it, and I think that this is uh, really, you know, what, what you can sort of hear, you can see a lot of this in, in Walter Williams' writings on economics, is always goes right. back to that very good grounding in, in that UCLA price theory, and in, in some ways, the price theory comes out of uh, property rights as well, because once you have very well set property rights and and the markets start to function and you start to have exchange and you start and then prices come out of all of that. But you know, it, 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 we can all trace it back to the fact that people have property rights and, and they're looking to exchange the things that they own, right? That's right. And by the way, a lot of us learned a lot of our economics from Armin Elchin's and William Allen's textbook, University Economics. I used it, I was a TA for that, for that uh, introductory course at UCLA. That book was so far above you know, introductory economics, so it didn't really work for the students, but it sure worked for the TAs. We learned so much. I worked my way every Sunday night through all the questions at the back of each chapter to be ready for the questions that those students never asked Monday morning. But that's all right, we learned, and a lot of people learned. And you will find economists around the country, around the world, who say they learned a lot of their price theory from university economics. By the way, it's been updated and put out by Liberty Fund now, and it's called Universal Economics. Oh. So, so it's, it's out there as a, as a new version that's very nicely priced. So yes, that's right, I mean, there's a huge amount of price theory in there. Graphs, occasionally uh, a, a simple equation a very simple algebraic equation, and, and they get so much mileage out of basic economics. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about one way that prices matter. And Armin Elchin talks about this, Harold Demsitz talks about this, and that is with regard to the economics of discrimination. So they give the example, you're an employer who's white, and you're somewhat racist and you are nervous about hiring black people, you just don't really want to. However, if you pass on a qualified black employee, you're gonna miss out on something. It might take an extra couple of weeks to find a white employee who's as good, and you've lost something. You might even lose a better black employee than the white employee who replaces him. And so there's what that means is the market, the free market through the price system makes people pay a cost for discriminating on racial grounds. Now have the government imposed a minimum wage and you're talking about very low skilled employees. Now you have people lining up to be your employees and you got really qualified white employees, really qualified black employees because the wage is above the free market wage. Then you will not pay a cost for discriminating. It'll be costless for you to choose the white employee over the black employee. And so they, they make that point in the wage context. They make that point when talking about rent control. Uh, they uh, Demsets did a study where he had 
where he looked at the Chicago Tribune year by year through World War II as the price controls on housing that were imposed nationally, they were imposed in each market on, on rental housing, as they got further and further out of whack with what the free market price would be because of the underlying inflation that was just distorted and hidden by price controls. And what he, what he was looking for two categories, restricted means you, we will not take black people because it was completely legal to advertise that in those days, and furniture, we will tie in the furniture. So you get the apartment, you pay a below market rent, but we're gonna sell you this crappy furniture for a high price. And what he found is the percent that were either restricted or furniture tie-in sales went up dramatically through the war as the price controls, the rent controls, got further and further out of whack with what the free market rent would be. So there was almost no cost of discriminating by the end of the war because you had lots of ten tenants lining up, wanting the apartment, and you could pick and choose. And so there's a, there's a case where the free market makes people pay a cost for discriminating. We had a recent example of that with the NBA. I don't know if you remember Donald Sterling who owned the Los Angeles Clippers. He made these just disgusting racist remarks. Well, I wrote a blog post pointing out the UCLA insight that yeah, he, he made these racist remarks, but if you look at his activities as an employer, you can't find a hint of racism. The three highest paid employees he had, the three highest paid uh, players, just their salaries together were 60% of the overall salary of the, being paid, and they were all black people. Mm -hmm. So even he, this racist guy, was constrained by the market to hire people who he might not want in his home. So then, you know, we, we've already touched a little bit on uh, some of Harold Demsetz's really important work that uh, on you know where property rights come from. Alchin and Demsetz also talk a lot, uh, they had a very famous paper where they talk about uh, the role of firms. And, and again, this t ties back to the whole issue of property rights to, to begin with. And, and I think it's even more uh, relevant today because in, in the uh, New York Times' 1619 project, one of the authors uh, in, in an essay about capitalism and slavery is trying to say that you know, much of uh, what we have employ you know, with employers monitoring their employees today it's all a, a, a product of, of, of slavery, and yet um, Alchin and Demsetz were, were talking about, you know, that, that that's an important thing that a, a firm would have to do, and from an economic or property rights perspective, if you even want to try to make sense of what a firm's going to do, uh, monitoring their employees or metering their, their, their employees is a, a, a crucial thing, right? That's right, that's right. They wrote, the, the article they did in that in the American Account Review was chosen by these people who included Kenneth Arrow, a Nobel Prize winner, and others as one of the 20 most important articles in the first 100 years of the American Economic Review. That's how wide, well thought of it was. And they basically, they make a number of points, but you put your finger on the most important one, that in a firm, for the firm to succeed, there has to be someone who is monitoring the output of the employees. Sometimes that's hard mm -hmm. because the output is hard to define. And then to some extent, you have to monitor input. You have to say, okay, what are they doing? And, and we're pretty sure this thing they're doing is going to make them more productive or less productive. And I get a kick out of your mention of the 1619 Project because anyone who goes into Walmart or any, any store who gets treated badly by an employee understands I would rather have the employer monitor the employees. I mean, everyone understands that. We customers are, are just vicious in, in our desire for good service. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, firms, employers who figure out a way of giving that good service are going to do well, all of the things equal. Now, you, you use an example in your, your book that I think is very good and I, I could relate this to a lot of our, our viewers, and that is, you know, when you have uh, students, when you had students in your classes write, work on a, a project, a, a term paper together, they face the same sort of product problem that, that firms face every day, right? That's right. Steve Globerman, the co my co-author, was the one who'd had a lot of experience with that as a professor, and so that those stories were from him. Uh, yeah, that's 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 right. And they figured out they had to figure, you know, they had to take somehow deal with what they called and what Elchin and Demsitz called the shirkers, people who weren't doing their fair share as part of the project. So, but by the way, 
That's why I, unlike Steve, my co-author, never gave joint projects. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I guess it's, in one sense, it's a good uh, a lesson that you know by taking their economics class, students would also learn some economics. And it, right. you know, and, and you also mentioned is is very important that when a firm's operating like this, they have to make sure that the rewards, that compensation, is actually tied to the the uh, employees who are not shirking, the employees who are actually doing the work, or else, you know, the, 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 that whole business isn't going to succeed. It's going to fail, and that's that's going to hurt all of the employees, even the ones who are trying to work hard, isn't it? That's right. That's right. And Armin Elchin, and I'm not sure if it's in that article or another article we do talk about in the book, um, points points out that you need what's called a residual claimant. And the advantage a for-profit firm has is there's always a residual claimant. What's that mean, that fancy language? It means someone who gets the difference between revenue and costs because that person has an incentive to keep the eye on revenue, that wants it to be higher, all things equal, and keep it on eye on costs, wants it to be lower, all other things equal. So he or she or they can get the residual. And they point out, they do some work on nonprofit firms and point out there's a systematic difference between for-profit firms and non-profit firms, non-profit firms and government also have no residual claimant. There's no one who gets a big benefit when the company does well or do, takes a big loss when the organization does badly. And I, I think that's a, a fascinating way because uh, another area, another big area of research at UCLA was in, in regulation. And I think you know, you, you lead into it. it, it really sort of follows again very naturally from this idea of property rights and under different situations, right, especially if you're talking about a government enterprise, but even if it's a government regulated private enterprise, you don't necessarily have the true residual claimant. And so, it, it, you know, again, this common theme of property rights and, and tracing it through in all of its different works. And, and so, I mean, a lot of the, the work in regulation against Soracy is like, well, what happens as we start to change the property rights as we might see it in the market or with a uh, for-profit corporation? And how is that those change in the rules going to affect outcomes? Right, that's right. And by the way, on the issue of regulation, two people we highlight on the book are Sam Peltzman, who I mentioned briefly earlier, and George Hilton. And they did some of the path-breaking work on, on regulation. So Sam, and we don't talk about this in the book, but I remember I mentioned I, I went and visited him. Um, I had read an article he wrote when he was a graduate student in the New, Individu New Individuals Review in the early 60s, laying out why we should deregulate airlines. I still think it's one of the best things ever written. I told him at a coffee once that I thought it was his best work. He didn't exactly like that. <laughs> but I mean, it was his best in the sense it was written really clearly, which graduate students kind of had an incentive to do. Anyway, uh, he laid that out. He was one of the first to lay it out. And guess what? We got deregulation under Jimmy Carter, and it, it worked phenomenally well. George Hilton did uh, some work with a a guy named Ross Eckert on jitneys. And the idea was that there were these municipal railways in the 20s that are municipal you know, streetcars, and they charged five cents no matter what the distance. So there, the short term, the short haul people were subsidizing the long haul people implicitly. And what happened was cars came along and just picked up people waiting for the, the streetcar and you know charged them a nickel. And it was neat because those people, the cars that came along, it wasn't like Uber where you order it. It was even better because the car that comes along is going from A to B and that's where you want to go because he's going to work also. And so peak supply happened when peak demand happened because people want to go work around the same time. And they point out that just systematically in municipality and you know, after municipality across America, the streetcar companies got the jitneys made illegal. Mm -hmm. and, that, and so... I took Hilton's class when that article came out, you know, his class on transportation, and that was a that was a big deal. That was a big splash. And and, and that's a a fascinating uh, story because I mean, in one part it, it reveals something else about like regulated uh, companies many times, and this is a notion of of cross subsidization. 
you, the, uh, the fair example would illustrate that. You got to use that term. So, because that, that was one of the other important findings that came out of uh, you know s the study of regulation at that time. That a lot of times what happened there was is what was known as, as cross subsidization going on. Yes, that's right. And Peltzman did some other work on that also. Mm -hmm. I know we have very limited time. Can we talk about one of the things that's near and dear to my heart in this book? Sure. So Demsets came up in this 1966 or 67 article with uh, the concept of the Nirvana approach which is the term now everyone uses is the nirvana fallacy, but he said it was the nirvana approach. And basically he's saying this, people will find some way that the market isn't working ideally. And then they'll say, oh, then we ought to have government. And then they stop their analysis. They, they used an analysis, they used incentives, they used price theory to say why this or that market didn't work ideally. And then they say, oh, we ought to have government. And then they don't say, well, why is government going to work better? Are the incentives better? Is the information better? And it's like blank. They, they, it's crickets, as they say. They don't even go there. And he took on a famous economist, Kenneth Arrow, who I mentioned earlier, and went after Arrow bit by bit, laying out how Arrow had the Nirvana approach. And there were three parts of the Nirvana approach. The grass is greener, the always greener fallacy. It's going to be better because it's not this. The free lunch fallacy, somehow there's going to be this free lunch out there when we have government. And and the people could be different fallacy. Oh, well, when we have government, they're going to be different from the private sector people and they're going to do it better. And that idea, which was 50 some years ago, 55 years ago, is still talked about in the profession. They now call it the Nirvana fallacy rather than Nirvana approach. And I'm not saying everyone has put that into their thinking about the world, but even people who advocate intervention will sometimes mention it, and then they'll wave their hands about why it's not a problem, but at least there's, it's become a kind of a mainstream idea. And, you know, that, that, that's really important because, you know, I, I mean, as Dem says, was probably one of the pioneers of this idea, you have to have a comparative institutional uh, analysis. You have to say, here's how this institution works, and, and if you tweak the rules some, Here's how this alternative uh, institution might work, and right. I, I guess it's important to point out that you know when, when the, the the UCLA uh, economists are, are frequently thought of as promote uh, pro free market, but probably more than anything else, what they were doing that they you know that they were at least being skeptical or saying you have to say in detail what the alternative would be, isn't it? Yes, that's right. They were pro free market. But they were pro-free market, and as you said, a comparative institutions approach. Like it's better than the alternatives almost all the time. And they weren't dogmatic about it. Show me this alternative, and show me how you're going to set up the incentives so it works better than the market. And that's kind of an unjoined debate, basically. People have not stepped up and said, say, why Obamacare is going to be better than the private insurance market with all its problems. There's, we're still waiting. Yeah, that, that's crucially important. And you know, we, we just have a little bit of time left, but I mean, there were, I mean, extensions of, of, of this, you know, property rights approach that have, have led to even further developments since then. I mean, a lot of uh, work in, in environmental economics has really t come out of the, the property rights approach and starting to be able to s conceptualize pollution, water pollution, as a, pro as a property rights problem, right? No, that's right, that's right. And they talk about that. We talk about that on the book. And, you know, uh, one example of property rights solving a pollution problem is rivers in Scotland. Uh, they are pristine. They're privately owned. And if you mess it up, the, the fishermen's organizations that own the river are going to come after you. And, and again, you know, it's just, a, again, there's this theme of, uh, of property rights. And, and, and I'll just uh, I'll, I'll end here with a, a pitch for our readers to take a look at your, your book because, you know, if you want to learn a lot about uh, economics and uh, also a lot about like this this very important uh, historical example of a, of a very influential school of economics, I, I recommend them that they take a look at your book. It was uh, published by the Fraser Institute, and, and they can get it on, on Amazon or, or elsewhere, right? That's right. They can even get a PDF free if they go to the Fraser website. Can't can't beat that. Fraser part. Institute, Canada. No, that's right. And, well, thanks very much for coming on, and, and thank you for joining us.
Join us again next time for another eConversations. This has been eConversations, a joint production of Troy Trojan Vision and the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University.